Hi, I'm Emily and I am here with Maya Murphy's attorney, Lauren McDonald. Attorney McDonald practices at Maya Murphy's Westport, Connecticut office and is admitted to practice law in both Connecticut and New York. My question today for Attorney McDonald is, what are my rights with respect to student discipline in public or private post-secondary education? Hey Emily, thank you for the question. So in Connecticut and New York, the most significant factor in determining the existence and scope of a student's procedural and substantive rights is whether the school at issue is a public or private university. It is settled law that institutions of post-secondary education that are considered public schools must, be, must afford constitutional protections to students accused of disciplinary violations since they are considered state actors and the student's educational progress is considered a protected liberty and property interest that triggers constitutional due process protections. Separately, students at public schools are protected by internal school procedure, school rules and guidelines, such as the school's violation of its internal disciplinary process may properly be the subject of a breach of contract claim. While constitutional due process and internal requirements may overlap, due process may impose requirements that go beyond school policy. By contrast, private colleges and universities are generally not subject to constitutional due process requirements. This means that as a rule, students at these institutions are protected by internal school rules and guidelines, but not by constitutional due process. There are nuances, of course, but this important distinction may come as a surprise to many private school students and may significantly narrow the options that are available to private school students. <clears throat> of course, the process, protections, and remedies available to private school students depend on what the particular private school's internal documents provide. The scope, meaning, and requirements of due process can be difficult to determine as well. As one Connecticut court put it, the procedures employed in disciplinary matters must be tested to the extent that they comport with the requirements of fundamental fairness. The traditional common law adversarial method need not be followed as long as the individual had an opportunity to answer, explain, and defend. It is important to note that due process in the context of educational discipline is not coextensive with due process in the criminal context. In general, there is no right per se to have counsel present in this context, nor is there a right, a per se right to an appeal of an adverse decision. In fact, courts considering due process requirements in this context have afforded a significant amount of latitude to schools in conducting disciplinary matters. Very generally, the basic elements of due process have been held to include one, which is notice of the nature of the charges. This is meant to provide an accused party with sufficient details and clarity to allow him or her to respond to the charges and prepare a defense. Two, an opportunity to challenge witnesses and produce witnesses on the accused student's behalf. And three, an impartial hearing and decision maker. Depending on the circumstances, this may include a requirement that the school make factual determinations supporting its disciplinary decision. Regardless of a student's particular circumstances, it is important for any student faced with disciplinary issues to understand what procedural and substantive rights are available. The most advantageous time to consider these issues is before, not after, disciplinary processes take place. Attacking a bad or unfair result or issues about process and procedure after the fact may be an option, but the practical difficulties are significant and putting an accused student back on track for graduation based upon a challenge to an unfavorable result can be much more challenging. If you are facing any disciplinary charges at your institution, please feel free to give me a call and I'd be happy to discuss with you. Attorney McDonald is available 24 seven and can be reached by calling 203-221-3100. You can also email Attorney McDonald at lmcdonald at mylaw.com and please visit mylaw.com for more information.